development and mining, rocks and rowing, a sport of which you can tell I love. Here's a man who I think can bridge both. Join me tonight as I map the mind and the moves of Ian Holzberger, chairman of IRH Metals Exploration Incorporated. So Ian, tell me, how and why did you get into the sport of competitive rowing? Yeah, that's an interesting question, Quentin. I, um, I'd played sport all my life, but it wasn't until I actually had children that I got involved in rowing. So you're a late, you're a late bloomer. I'm a late bloomer, yeah. I was, uh, Doesn't seem like it from the way you row, but uh, tell us how you got into it. Yeah, that was well into my late 40s when I got into it. My daughter got involved in rowing through her school and uh, I just um, fell in love with the sport, grew a passion for it, so I've now been rowing, as you know, competitively for about 14 years in the, uh, in the Masters age groups. Yeah, it's a fantastic sport. It gives you an opportunity to, to relax and clear your mind, but most importantly, is a lot of life lessons in sport because it is the consummate team sport. A rowing boat won't go well unless everyone's doing the same thing. You can see that already from the water, somebody's going behind or ahead of somebody else, right? Yeah, that's interesting. You know, the um, rowing now is used in a lot of uh, executive development programs as a sport to teach um, leadership, to teach um, uh, teamwork, to teach companionship. So it is a very, very um, good reflection on life and the work environment. Another aspect of rowing is you can travel around the world anywhere and find a rowing club, always full of friendly people. Yeah, with the same always, passion, with the yeah. same dying, undying passion for it. Absolutely. Right? Take you for a row, you can go to regattas all around the world and basically use an excuse to travel on holiday. I think, what it's else would I you think I, personally, for me, I think it's the best fraternity in the world. I, I feel that whenever we go to other clubs. Yeah, always, always friendly, always smiling faces in clubs, always willing to um, to take you for a row and, and have you join in their their events and and their um, their club. But Ian, speaking of clubs, you are actually the boat captain of the Manila Boat Club. Tell us how special that is for you in terms of giving back, paying forward, and building the sport of rowing in the Philippines. Yeah, um, as you know, I'm, I'm in, a, in a, a big club in Brisbane and I'm, I'm the chairman of that club. Um, when I started traveling to Manila uh, about eight years ago with my current role, I, um, I was missing my sport. So I actually started looking around. I didn't know there was a club here. And uh, after a bit of time, I actually located the club. And I came down here and it was, wasn't in a, in a particularly happy state. Uh, very few members, um, very old boats, um, and basically not a lot of This happened to be the oldest sporting club in the Philippines. Well, that's the thing that struck me. I wandered down here onto the ramp and looked around there and saw that 1895, the club was created. So here's a sporting club in, in Manila, over 100 years old, in the sport that I love. So I basically asked around and a number of people became interested and to some degree we've revitalised the sport on the river. So for me to, to see the sport kicking on, to see the, the national squad and to be able to participate in, in kind of securing the sport in, in Manila is, is a great privilege actually. I really, really enjoy it. So yes, I serve as boat, boat captain to the club. So it's my way of putting a little bit back into the sport that I enjoy so much. As someone who's come back a little later than when you came back and seen that journey and helped that journey along, um, I'm really proud to see that the, the club and rowing has grown even beyond Manila. So tell us about the Pauai Regatta and your role as race director there, at least for the last two years. Yeah, one, one of the things about rowing is it's always been considered an elitist sport, when in, in fact it isn't. Um, and so to be able to take rowing outside the normal uh, the normal areas that it's rowed in and to see new clubs spawned and to allow access to those clubs by everyone is, is actually a fantastic, uh, once again, a fantastic privilege. The club that I participate in in Brisbane, we call ourselves a community club. So we take people from, from basically all levels of, of society into row, from children all the way through to, to old buggers like me. So, um, and that's what I think, uh, that's what I think the future of rowing is. So to see the new club spawned, the power, power Poi regatta to see the club created up there to be able to participate in those regattas 
I think is, is a great way of putting back into the sport. Yeah, and, and growing into the grassroots level. And speaking of grassroots, we better push off because these lilies are starting to bug us. Yeah, I think the and, and grassroots get are coming to in, us. Right? <laughs> Shall we? Yep. All right. You chose to invest and build a project right here in the yeah. Philippines, in central Luzon. Tell us, what was the decision like? What were the drivers there? And how did you manage the risks? Hmm. As I said, I like challenges, <laughs> fortunately. <laughs> Certainly, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> the Philippines has got a, got a, 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 a tremendous mineral inventory. It, it can be an engine for this country. Um, I do understand the, the, the issues of the past, and I do understand that we can do it better. So, you know, sustainable mining is where it's at. It feels so good to be back at our second home here with our nice little uniforms. But as we finished rowing, I was changing in the locker room. I started thinking about what one of my favorite authors used to say, which is days that were begun rowing on a lake or a river are certainly much better than days that are not. Speaking of beginnings, let's take you back to the teenage Ian Holzberger in rural outback Australia, deciding on a field of study. Why did you choose geology as a science and as a field of research and expertise. Well, it's an interesting story, you know. Life is full of opportunities and challenges, and when, when either of them meet you, you've got to take them head on. Um, for all my young years, my teenage years, I wanted to be a pilot. I was um, pretty keen to get out of Broken Hill, which is, which is where I was brought up, as you say, in rural western New South Wales, and uh, become a pilot, see the world and, and travel around. But as fate would have it, I was actually offered a cadetship in geology. Uh, cadetship is, a, is effectively employment and sponsorship to go to university. So the first opportunity, first major opportunity in my life was presented to me. I took it up with a view that I'd, I'd use it as a stepping stone to the future. But once I immersed myself into geology, because I hadn't really ever studied it before, I found it a, a, a fa fascinating science. And from that, I developed my career. Now tell us, was you had a degree in mathematics as well. You pursued Correct. mathematics. Mm -hmm. How natural were the natural sciences to you uh, as a field of study, and how it molded your career and your way of thinking? Yeah, look, natural sciences came naturally to me. Um, maths was always one of my strong suits. Um, trying to understand why things work and how they work and, and uh, develop new discoveries was always something I was interested in. I was always as a child, I was always in trouble for pulling things apart to see how they worked. Um, but I think the, the most formative thing in, in a career is to have mentors. People that actually take you under the wing and share their incredible knowledge of, of the field they're working in and, and assist you to develop your, your career. So I was very fortunate. I've had a, a series of fantastic mentors, you know, people that are 20, 30 years my senior that have actually mentored, trained me, shown me, um, and as a, because of that, I've been able to exp um, expand my career and my understanding of my, my cho chosen profession much more significantly. Years later, here you are, an undergraduate degree in geology, postgraduate degree in mineral economics, and the whole world was at your feet. You could actually go on either to the academe or a safer and probably even more lucrative sector like the upstream oil and gas industry. And yet you chose the very, very difficult and controversial sector of mining. Tell us what went through your mind. Do you regret getting into mining? And how did you transition into this difficult sector? Mining is an interesting, interesting conundrum because uh, I think it's something that we love, love to hate. What most of us don't realize is that our lifestyle is totally supported by mining. So everything we do from the clothes we wear to the cars we drive to the cell phones we use to the houses we live in is dependent on mining. So without mining, our, our standard of living would be very, very much reduced. It's interesting, I heard a scientist used to say that um, if you can't grow it, you've got to mine it. Correct. It's, it's, certainly the, it's certainly the case when you were starting to consider a career. 
Mining to some degree came naturally for me because Broken Hill was a mining town, so I effectively was immersed in mining or mining area uh, from birth. Um, my father and my grandfather worked in the mining industry, so the mining industry for me wasn't such, such a, a giant leap forward. But, you know, I do understand that mining is a controversial sector. And I think it's mainly because it's misunderstood. I think it's like most uh, industry, um, the practices of the past are no longer sustainable. So the industry has to move to develop practices for the future. But, but yes, it is controversial. Should it be controversial? Well, if we want the lifestyles and the life standards that we have and we, we aspire to, then it can't be controversial. We do have to be able to work in the environment and with the environment in a sustainable fashion. So, controversy every day. Should it be controversial? No, it shouldn't be. Well, when you talk about controversy, there is no other country in the world than the Philippines that actually thinks mining is a controversial sector. And yet you chose to invest and build a project right here in the yeah. Philippines, in central Luzon. Tell us, what was the decision like? What were the drivers there? And how did you manage the risks? Hmm. As I said, I like challenges, <laughs> fortunately. Certainly, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> the Philippines has got a, got a, 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 a tremendous mineral inventory. It, it can be an engine for this country. Um, I do understand the, the, the issues of the past, and I do understand that we can do it better. So, you know, sustainable mining is where it's at. Um, the opportunity presented itself in some ways. The opportunity came across my desk rather than me specifically hunting it out. But um, once I actually had a look at the opportunity, then it was plain to me that there was, there was a, a genuine and real opportunity to build a mine, to build it and do it correctly. Uh, and it was worth the effort and the investment. I still see that as the case. Uh, we do get bold challenges each and every day. But uh, we work through them. We are, we are a responsible company. I have interesting discussions at my home. Uh, at home, my son's basically an environmental scientist, so he keeps me very honest in our environmental performance, which I'm proud of. But that's the way of the future for mine. It's actually to do it once and do it right. See, I find it really interesting that you've bridged different worlds. You've bridged the world of rowing and mining, waterways and rocks, and at the same time, you're looking at a difficult industry in your field of study. Mm. Um, I wanted to understand, more importantly, when you started your career, you were actually going to di different jurisdictions. Can you tell us about the transition in your mindset, how you were able to adopt to this environment mm. and excel? Yeah, look, the, the, the larger part of my career has actually been in, in developing nations. Um, and I would even include parts of Australia in that because working in the outback, working in traditional society in the outback, you actually have to learn to understand some of the connections to the land and the environment that, that aren't actually natural for people born into Western society in, in the city. You have a strong Aboriginal culture also mm. in Australia, so you have to Absolutely. work with that as well. And, and I did actually grow up in the country, so I had a little bit of a bridge there anyway because my maternal grandparents were on, on a property, so a sheep property. So there was a connection there anyway. Um, but I now have about 25, 26 years of my career has been, been offshore. I've worked in the Solomon Islands, uh, Indonesia, the Philippines, um, Papua New Guinea, and also in, in, in developed countries, uh, the US and Canada and Australia, of course, um, and, and Russia even. Um, I think the the issue is you have to stop listening and un try and understand and learn from the lessons from the past. Great believer in taking lessons from the past. There's a great history there. You don't have to repeat the mistakes, but you can certainly learn from them. So I, I became a bit of a student of, of the way that traditional society was, was managed in Papua New Guinea in particular, using the Bougainville example. Um, stopped, listened. I could never pretend to totally understand the connection for tra traditional society to the land, but I certainly make a very large effort to, to bridge that, that gap. So it, it, it's a matter of mindset. Uh, it's a matter of, of throwing away a lot of our Western ideals or modifying our Western ideas and fitting it back into traditional society and understanding what the land and the environment means to people. Well, Ian, we had a great start of the day. Unfortunately, we've got to leave this wonderful club and off to work. But thanks for your initial questions. We'll see you in a bit at work. Thanks. Great. Great. In the course of your career, you've made a transition that not a lot of people get to do. From a technical professional, you became an investor and an entrepreneur. How did you manage that? And what did it take to get there? 
I think um, earlier when we spoke I was uh, indicating that I had a lot of mentors and, and that gave me a very significant opportunity to expand my career, uh, not only in the technical sciences but also in management. Ian, in the course of your career, you've made a transition that not a lot of people get to do. From a technical professional, you became an investor and an entrepreneur. How did you manage that and what did it take to get there? Well, I think um, earlier when we spoke, I was uh, indicating that I had a lot of mentors and, and that gave me a very significant opportunity to expand my career, uh, not only in the technical sciences, but also in management. Uh, with some post postgraduate studies in mineral economics, broaden it up quite quite considerably. I guess the other thing that, that that's really important is I, I was born inquisitive, um, so I always want to understand how, why, what for, and so with those 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 kind of that natural desire, I guess, and the training I had, it seemed to be a logical step. So quite early in my career, I was promoted into management structure of companies. And from then, opportunity really presented itself. And, and as I said earlier, life full of opportunities and challenges, you've got to tackle both of them head on. So take your opportunities as they come, knock over your challenges as they come and, and move on. So, and and that's, that's it, I've had a very fortunate career. Okay. Ian, you've risen up the corporate ladder, but you've gone also across in terms of de dealing with different stakeholders, communities mm -hmm. and people. Tell us about uh, working on the people management side not just the numbers, but also the business itself, the project, and how do all of these things come together? Good people. I mean, you, can't, you can never do anything by yourself. Um, you're only as good as the people that work for you. Um, obviously, you know, I see my role now largely as guidance, direction, mentoring. The works, the hard works, the sweat works done by these guys. And, and you know, we've got 700 people up on the side at the moment. So the 700, 100 odd people around. So, you know, we're very big. You know, my favorite word at the moment is mentoring. Uh, we have a lot of, of, of young, enthusiastic, keen Philippine graduates in, in the sciences and in the engineering. Um, we, have a, we have a small quadrille of, of expatriates, about 10 in total. They're here to mentor and train those people so that they can, they can work up the ladder, give them the opportunities that were presented to me. Not everyone will take it, but, but those that have the thirst and the hunger will. And because grow you've got a handout for those willing to try. Absolutely, and that's, that's, that's part of my role in life now, is you know, I you know, kind of can see the end of my career out there somewhere, another 20 or 30 years, but I've had a lot of opportunity, I have to hand a lot of that. I have to hand a lot of that back for the next generation. Otherwise, we won't have a next generation in, the, in this industry, yeah. Now, we'll talk about two themes as we close this interview. One is about balance and the other one is about paying forward. Let's talk about the balance part first. You've been able to balance the different worlds of mining and the environment, work and life balance because of your rowing, your competitive rowing, your mentorship, mm. and the actual demands of a day-to-day -day job. Yep. How do you get this all together? How do, what does integration look like for Ian Holzberger? I think the key is integration. Um, they shouldn't be looked at separate aspects of a life or, or whatever, you do have to integrate them. Work with your community, develop the skill sets in your community. Free handouts are no good. You know, I'll, I'll uh, verse out of the Bible, teach a man to fish and he'll feed himself. Absolute devotee to that. I'm a devotee of sweat labour. I'm a believer that when we contribute something, we look a, for a joint contribution because once there's sweat labour in something, then there's a value attributed to it. If I just give it away, there's no value attributed. So we work our programs pretty hard. We've got a great um, um, uh, 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 community relation team. Um, we've got some, some very sound policies and Im implementation. We work, we also believe that the primary beneficiaries should be our impact area. So we work very closely with those people to develop the skills so as much of the benefit can be captured back into the environment in which we work. Bottom line for mining, if your local community doesn't want you to be there, you'll you're not going to be there. there. You're and not going to be there. And these mines have a finite life and you're looking at sustainability and empowerment as in the future. And the best way for that, of course, is education and skills. <coughs> so, as we know, one of the, the greatest exports in the Philippines 
as, as the overseas worker. Um, if we actually imbue people with skill sets and training, um, then those people can go off. Uh, at the end of the mine, they can sustain their families and sustain the community that's there. They will also expect to be leaving functioning businesses and other, other, other opportunities there. So we work very hard at the educational capacity. Virtually all of our, our workforce, we are a startup. We started from ground zero. All of our workforce, our operators in our mill, the truck drivers in our fleet, the excavator operators, are local people with zero experience that have been trained by, by the people we've brought in and they're now operating. You know, As you've professionals. Got, you've yeah. got little girls this tall driving 100 ton, uh, 100 ton dump trucks, million dollars worth of truck driving around on the road. Girls that have never driven a car. Transferable until skill around the world. Absolutely. They could go and work anywhere in the world. Before they started with us, some of them had never driven a car. Incredible transformation, very rewarding. Well, you know, it's been a great journey of empowerment, sustainability, and a lot of hard work, to tell you the truth. So mm. I'm looking forward to hearing about your next steps in the journey. As you mentioned before, you wanted to be a pilot. This is a long runway for you. I look forward <laughs> to hearing more about the story, or at least seeing you in the water soon. Yeah, we will indeed. Okay, thanks, thanks again for a good morning. All right, Wait take care. Cheers. Take care. probably couldn't be anything more different than rocks and rowing, mining and the environment. And yet Ian Holzberger seems to bridge the two. This is Kinton Pastrana. Join me again next week. Mm -hmm.